Hello and welcome. Nigerian returnees from Saudi Arabia allege high-handedness by consulate officials as they recount stories of abuse and molestation by their Arabian bosses. Armed bandits strike in Niger State, killing at least seven people, including military officers. Securing Ogun State is my priority, says Governor Dapa Biodun at the inauguration of Amatekon Security Corps, where Nobel laureate Wole Shoinka was named as Super Marshal. And a paramedic testifies on how he had to indicate that U.S. police officer Derek Chauvin should move off George Floyd's limp body when he arrived at the scene of the encounter. Plus for her business, sports, news from Abuja, and later on, international news from our London studios. On business news tonight, OPEC Plus agreed to gradually increase crude output as demand concerns persist. On sports news tonight, humanitarian organization auctions Cristiano Ronaldo's The Scarlet Captain's Armband to raise money for a sick child in Serbia. The latest returnees from Saudi Arabia are alleging that the Nigerian consulate in Saudi Arabia is returning more citizens of neighboring Niger Republic than Nigerians who were stuck in deportation camps in the Arabian country. These Nigerians, who serve mostly as domestic workers in Saudi Arabia, are also accusing their former bosses of sexually molesting and maltreating them while in their service. The returnees are being camped at the FCT Hajj camp in the nation's capital, in line with COVID-19 protocols. Our correspondent, Kayla Megwa, reports. They've been back to Nigeria for about two days now. These are part of the latest three batches of returnees from Saudi Arabia in the last one week. They were returned to the country for multiple reasons, ranging from being trafficked to being stranded. Some were even born in Saudi Arabia and are here in Nigeria for the very first time. Men, women and children glad for the opportunity to start life afresh in their motherland. But there's a problem. They are concerned about other Nigerians stranded in deportation camps in Saudi Arabia. They are accusing the Nigerian consulate in Saudi Arabia of returning more people from Niger Republic than actual Nigerians. They are, not, they are not Nigerians, they are Niger. I can see Kenji, they are Niger. Nigerians are dead, they are suffering. I was there for two months plus in the deportation camp. We see, now we have 390 something returnees. We have 20 Yorubas. What do you do to them? Turn the ground and let's talk about Saudi and Nike Okuka. Go and eat and buy your ticket and buy your Saudi Aba. So what are you going to do? I'm going to go and 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 I'm going to go so we do have the access to my skin. Our madam husband, they are raping us. A lot of ladies here, they are pregnant. A lot of them pregnant. They are raping them. They owe me six months salary. I just leave it. That's about how much? That's about six hundred thousand. There are some people that are still there. Six months. I used five months there in the prison with two food. While calling for calm, the Nigerian authorities address the allegations. I'm telling you with the permission of the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs, what you have said here will not go uninvestigated. Now, I will meet with those who have said this and ensure that they tell us specific mission. And if you have names, let us know. From the poor finding, the numbers of people that we find are non Nigerians is negligible. In, in our, during our poor finding in January, out of almost 1,250 1, people, only five people were non Nigerians. Since January of 2021, over 3,000 people have been returned from Saudi Arabia. The last week has seen the return of over 1,000 persons. Some of them have tested positive for COVID 19, but they'll be receiving home care as they are asymptomatic. Accusations of abuse and maltreatment of Nigerians in foreign countries have been rife in recent years. A viral video from India recently alleged that a Nigerian was killed in India, prompting protests and calls for intervention from the Nigerian government. We are discussing with the Indian authority and our charge affair in India is also on top of it. We have received reports 
Now you have to be careful some of the things you have on social media. Some of them try to depict as if government is uh, ignoring or ineffective. There is nothing like that. Now when things happen outside your, 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 your soil, outside your, your shores, you do not have uh, entire control over that. For this newly returned batch of returnees from Saudi Arabia, their journey towards reintegration starts right here at the camp. And the government says they will be taking care of them for the next three days until they go back to their states of origin. For the cases of abuse, the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs have promised that whatever cases are being reported to them formally will be looked into. Kayla Magua, Channel Television News. Moving to the southeast, the people of Isofia community in Aguata local government area of Anambra State are appealing to the state government to strengthen security surveillance in Aguata, especially Ikulobia access, which according to them appears to be under siege. The plea follows yesterday's attack on the governorship aspirant and former governor of the CBN, Professor Charles Soludo, in which three of his security operatives were killed. Some of them have also been speaking about the incident, which they say took them by surprise. Meanwhile, Professor Charles Soludo has also been speaking about the attack, and he feels the incident may be politically motivated because of his ambition to run for governor in November this year. He says the gun battle between the gunman and his police officers lasted for over 10 minutes. Professor Soludo was a guest earlier today on our political program, Politics Today. There have been wide demand across the state with hundreds of thousands of a number of people demanding that I should um, run for this office. And so, uh, more recently, I began to indicate that, yes, if my party grants me the uh, honor of flying their ticket, and uh, that I will, I will be on the ballot uh, by the grace of that. And um, I guess part of what is fueling the theories of the political motivation for what happened yesterday is that uh, several people, many people feel that um, while the election might be for us to lose if we're on the ballot, and that uh, if we're on the ballot, then many others or the others contestant in whatever party probably have their chances uh, reduced significantly and therefore that the only way to increase their chance was if Soludo was not on the ballot. But like I said, I'm not believing um, any of those until the result is out. So yes, in very simple terms, if, uh, after the wide consultations and we get on to June, and my party gives me the honor of flying their tickets, we'll present ourselves to the Anambra people. And um, from all indications so far, I believe that by the grace of God, the number of people will um, endorse that choice. And from the southeast to Niger State, where seven persons, including security operatives, are reported to have been killed in fresh attacks on communities in Shiroro local government area of the state. The gunmen reportedly invaded Alawa, Manta, Gumana, Basa and Koki last night to the early hours of today, abducting over 10 persons and stealing several motorcycles after setting ablaze some military vehicles. Some soldiers were said to be among those killed in the attack, although this is yet to be confirmed by military authorities. Eyewitness accounts have it that the bandits stormed the camp of the Joint Security Task Force comprising the army, police, civil defense and vigilantes at Alawa and open fire on them. The president of the Shiroro Youth Movement and chairman of Shiroro Council, Mohammed Idris, said the bandits, armed with AK-47s and numbering 100, attacked each of the communities for about five hours unchallenged. However, efforts to get the reaction of the state police failed, as the public relations officer, DSP Wasiwa Biodun, did not respond to calls put through to him. The Nigerian Air Force says it's intensifying efforts to track one of its Alpha jets, which was declared missing after it lost contact with radar in Bruno State while providing support for ground troops last night. 
The spokesperson of the Nigeria Air Force, Air Commodore Edward Gapquet, said in a statement that the jet was on a mission as part of the counterinsurgency operations in the Northeast. While admitting that details of the whereabouts of the aircraft or likely cause of the contact loss are still sketchy, Air Commodore Gapquet notes that search and rescue efforts are ongoing, promising to make public details surrounding the incident. Meanwhile, the Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Ola Amao, has arrived in Meduguri, the Borno State capital, and has received a briefing on the current search and rescue efforts in connection with the missing aircraft. Over in Ogun State, the government there has inaugurated the state security network agency known as Amotekun to strengthen the security architecture in the state. At a ceremony held at the arcade ground of the governor's office in Abeokuta, the state capital, the state governor, Dapwa Biodun, said the move is imperative to stem the tide of security challenges witnessed in the state in recent times. Nobel laureate Professor Wale Shoyinka is also decorated as the Super Marshal of the Amotekun Corps. The event is well attended by heads of security agencies in the state, as well as traditional, religious and community leaders. They've come to witness the commencement of the state security network, christened the Amotekun Corps. As soon as he arrives, the venue of the event, in company of Nobel laureate, Professor Wally Shoinka, Governor Dapo Abiodun, who donned the Amotekun uniform, inspects the Guard of Honor, signaling the inauguration of the security outfit. In his address, Governor Abiodun reminds the officers that securing the state requires commitment a sense of purpose and cooperation with sister security agencies. Amotekun is not a competition with other security agencies in the state. And that is why everybody must work together to further strengthen the security of lives and property in our state. Goodwill messages follow from the Ogun State Commission of Police and the Secretary General of the Committee for the Defense of Human Rights. We're having Amotekun to boot and I want to assure His Excellency and the good people of Ogun State that we all work uh, closely together in the area of uh, uh, sharing of information as well as in the joint operations. We shall do everything possible to foster our partnership just the way we have been doing with the SOSA and other security agencies in the state to ensure that Amoteko is giving maximum support from the grassroots. So I always hold it symbolically. This cap to prof being the super marshal of Amotekun in Ogun State. Professor Shoyinka, who was decorated as a super marshal of the Amotekun Corps, asks officers of the outfit to be mindful of the rules of engagement. We'll be watching you very closely to make sure you do not trample on the rights of citizens. You've been uh, created to assist them, to protect them, to be part of them, to live inside them, to gather information, to say to the police, the military, we cannot handle this, but we have seen this. Would you like to take a look and assist? You are not here because you are now you now have a uniform to start behaving like some other security agencies who shall be nameless. Uh, the way they've been dealing, you know, you have to set an example to say that you are a civic unit. Before departing the venue, Governor Biodu and the dignitaries commissioned the security patrol vehicles, communication gadgets and motorcycles, all procured to enhance the operations of the core members as they prepare to swing into full action.
In part two, after the break, residents of Osborne Foreshore Phase 2 Estate Ikoi proposed environmental audit and review of approval order by the Lagos State Government. That's in a moment. Please join us again. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channels Television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Nigerian returnees from Saudi Arabia allege high-handedness by consulate officials. They recount stories of abuse and molestation by their Arabian bosses. Armed bandits strike in Niger state, killing at least seven people, including military officers. Securing Ogun State is my priority, says Governor Dakwa Biodun at the inauguration of Amotekun Security Corps, where Nobel laureate Professor Wale Shoinka was named as a super marshal. And paramedic testifies on how he had to indicate that U.S. police officer Derek Chauvin should move off George Floyd's limp body when he arrived the scene of the encounter. As part of efforts aimed at improving the security of lives and property in Oyo State, another public engagement with traditional rulers and security operatives has taken place in the state capital with a commitment of synergy among all stakeholders. At the meeting, Governor Shei Makinde declared that his administration will continue to work with traditional rulers in the state to tackle insecurity and return normalcy to all areas. Traditional leaders from Ibadan, Oyo and Ogbomosho, led by the Allah Afyon Foyo, Lamidi Adeyemi, security chiefs, politicians and the former governor are gathered at the House of Chiefs for a critical stakeholders meeting. <coughs> the agenda remains the way out of current security challenges confronting the state. Governor Makinde is not swayed in his commitment to finding lasting solutions to the issue. Security cannot work without intelligence gathering. So our calling you here is because we want you to be a big part of what we're doing. A major player in tackling the issue of insecurity. Earlier, the Alafi of Oyo said state governors should not be blamed for the insecurity within their states as they hardly control the security agencies there. While advocating for state police, the monarch said it was necessary to break the gag of all the state governments remaining puppets under the federal government. In his remark, the Olubad of Ibadan land, represented by Lekon Balogun, asked for better collaboration among the three major groups that he identified. Three people are responsible for our security. Those in government, starting with the government, the rest of them. Uh, those in uniform, police and other security forces. And the third group, is the traditional authorities. Leading security operatives at the meeting, the Oyo State Commissioner of Police, Mrs. Ngozi Onadeko, believes residents can be of tremendous help to security agencies if they provide intelligence tips. We will try our humanly possible best to make sure that we discharge our duties. But I will need everybody to cooperate with the police cooperate with the security agencies, give us vital and reliable information.
at the end of the session. The agreement here is for residents and the traditional institutions to support the security agencies at ensuring the safety of lives and property in Oyo State. Bukola Uriowo, Channel Television News. Let's cross over to Abuja now, and here's Terry Ikumi. Terry. Hello and welcome to the nation's capital. The president is reiterating his position that Nigerians are better and stronger together as one, and he is calling on citizens not to allow mischief makers to fragment the unity and faith that the vast majority of citizens of this country cherish and believe in. President Buhari's position is contained in his Easter message to Nigerians, noting that the Easter celebration is an opportunity to renew hope and faith, show love and appreciation to one another, and not to despair, no matter the challenges of the period. The statement reads in part, As a government, we will continue to ensure that the weak, the poor, and the underprivileged in our midst are not abandoned. That is the spirit of Easter, the spirit of faith, the spirit of belief, the spirit of hope. The president equally commends law enforcement and military officers who continue to confront evil-minded individuals through the darkest of nights to keep the country safe and he hopes their efforts become part of the nation's history. Over 51 million Nigerians have now been enrolled for the national identity number. Minister of Communications and Digital Economy Dr. Isa Pantami disclosed this at the sixth series of the ministerial briefing organized by the presidential media team at the State House. Dr. Pantami, who explains that there is no plan to lift the ban on new SIM registration anytime soon, underscores that failure to obtain the NIN could lead to imprisonment, as stipulated by the Nigerian constitution. Our State House correspondent, Gloria Umezioke, reports. In continuation of ministerial briefings, the sixth in the series, the subject of the integration of the subscriber identity module and the national identification number gained more clarity. The Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, Dr. Isa Pantami, explains that the government will not renege on the SIM registration ban for security reasons, arising from huge compromise of the process. The ban on SIM, we definitely know. It may affect our economy in some ways. But when addressing the issue of security, the issue of economy is second. Why? Because you have to protect your citizens. When a crime was committed and you receive the information and the biodata, you will not be able to trace anybody in the country. Why? Because of improperly registered. Your biometric in your SIM must match with that of your national identity number so that government will know you are the owner of this sim and if i'm innocent i don't have any problem when government knows that i'm the owner of this card the sim but as you know criminals whether among the bandits or kidnappers or terrorists or anywhere they are they always exploit this sim Dr. Pantami reiterates that while obtaining a sim card may be optional that of the nin is mandatory the total number of unique NI that are 100% ready is more than 51 million. More than 51 million. And we said that SIM is around 189. So if you compute one NI accommodating three to four SIMs, you will discover when the process is completed, uh, it will accommodate more than 90% of the existing SIMs we have. We want to reach a situation that if you go for a passport, only give them your name. Driver's license, give them your name. Whatever you need, you only need to present your name because it is the primary database of Nigeria. He adds that failure to obtain the name can result in a prison sentence. For you to get voter's card in Nigeria based on 20, Section 27 of NIMSI Act, it is an offense. For you to open a bank account without national identity number is an offense. For you to pay tax is an offense. For you to Collect pension is an offense. For you to enjoy any government service without having national identity number is an offense. Section 29 says, if you do any of this in 27, without obtaining national identity, you have committed a crime that will lead to fine or imprisonment or both of them. And this is 14 years, not today. 
Dr. Pantame puts the number of SIM card subscribers linked to the national identification number at over 150 million. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. To politics, the Independent National Electoral Commission will commence the continuous voters registration exercise on June the 28th. That's according to INEC Chairman Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, who indicated that the registration will be carried out in one year. He explains that emphasis will be on Anambra State, where election is to be held in November 2021. Those qualified for the CVR exercise include Nigerians who are 18 years old and have never been registered to vote, any registered voter who has had any issue during accreditation at previous elections, all registered voters who wish to transfer their voting locations from the present one to another, all registered voters who have lost their PVCs or whose PVCs have been defaced or damaged, and all registered voters who wish to correct their information such as names, date of birth, and others. The following critical activities will be accomplished within the following timelines leading to the recommencement of the exercise. Number one, expansion of voter access to polling units, 11th May 2021. Building and testing the online registration portal, 15th May 2021. Arrival of the new generation of registration devices, the IVED, 31st May 2021. Recruitment and training of voter enrollment staff, 14th June 2021. Restart of the CVR, 28th June 2021. Effective from Monday, 28th June 2021, the CVR exercise will commence nationwide and carried out continuously for over a year until the third quarter of 2022. However, emphasis will initially be on Anambra State, where more centers will be established in view of the governorship election already scheduled to hold on the 6th of November 2021. In order to complete preparations for the governorship election, the severe exercise in the state will be temporarily suspended in August 2021. This will enable the Commission to clean up the data for the state and print the PVCs for registrants. As time goes on, the Commission will provide more details on the CVR exercise, particularly the innovations that will ensure a safe and stress-free experience for registrants. To the courts now, the Court of Appeals sitting in Abuja has quashed the 2.1 billion naira money laundering charge filed against the founder of Dark Communications PLC, Mr. Raymond Dopesi, by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. As the appellate court upheld Mr. Dopesi's no-case submission filed before the court. In a judgment in an appeal filed by Mr. Kanu Agabi, SAN, on behalf of Dopesi, Justice Elfrida Williams Daudu, who read the unanimous judgment of the three-man panel of the court, held that the EFCC failed woefully to establish a prima facie case against the appellant in, a, in all the seven counts charged. The appellate court agreed with Mr. Gabi that being a predicate offence, the ingredients of the offences against the appellant must be clearly provided, adding that it is clear that none of the offences was established in line with the provisions of the law. The court further held that the FCC failed to prove that the 2.1 billion naira allegedly received by the appellant as payment was a proceed of criminal breach of trust. A federal high court, Abuja, presided over by Justice John Soho, had in November 2018 dismissed the no-case submission filed by Mr. Dopesi on the grounds that a prima facie case had been successfully established against him by the EFCC in the alleged 2.1 billion naira money laundering suit. Well, that's all from Abuja. It's back to you, Ijoma. Thanks a lot for that, Terry. Well, we can now bring you a bit more about yesterday's attack on the former CBN governor, Professor Charles Saludo. Let's just listen in and hear from some of the eyewitnesses. Saludo, that is the next governor to be, he called youth to address to address the youth of Umezi Sofia. 
So they see suddenly they see gunmen begin firing gun, shooting gun. So everybody begin run for his or her life. In the process of running, they get two people and one police down. The two heroes enter later towards four thirds. Then I think they are, they are security. What they do that they're changing all when the blade enter. The one policeman is here. One is from that front, one is in the, in the door. Come outside and know what is going on. Then the lady, one, one the lady follow them come. Thus, carried her to pull for trigger. Carried the, drop the policeman there. The boy with the red and red, drop the other one. One man is here. Carried the policeman where there for that door. Before he run, enter there. Go, go forward there. To other stories now, the Lagos State Government is conducting an environmental audit of Osborne Foreshore Phase 2 Estate, Ikui, and also proposing a review of the approval order in the estate. The exercise comes amid concerns raised by the Osborne Foreshore Residents Association that some developers are distorting the estate's original master plan. The exercise, spearheaded by the Lagos State Ministry of Physical Planning and Urban Development, brought together interested parties to come up with an effective operational development plan. Our correspondent, Dare Do, reports. This is Osborne Foreshore Phase 2, initially designed by the federal government as a low-density estate of 20 units per hectare and later increased to 30 units per hectare. Over the years, the land area has also gained some width from 21 hectares to 64.1 hectares. More land has been reclaimed from the lagoon, a key feature of the upscale neighborhood. This meeting called by the state government is to review the extent approval order aimed at correcting some of the infractions raised by the resident association and as well reflect on the current socio-economic realities. This was the business of the day. The review, or let's say the proposed review. This is a map. As the state official prepares to set the tone for the meeting, taking the stakeholders through the government's proposal, the already charged atmosphere turns rowdy. When order returns to the auditorium, each of the stakeholders present their arguments premised on investment, safety, law and order. Was approval given by the government for you to bring, build 84 units on that plot of land, number one. And what is the commensurate parking space and the sewage system that you have provided for 84 families on that plot of land, number two. Then number three, how many road networks do we have in Osborne for sure two? Just one that stretches long. The other roads are just smaller inlet roads that we have. There was talk of overstretched road. There was a mention of overstretched roads. The road in Osborne Fortress is at least 7.5 to 8 meters wide. The whole the entrance road, top road that leads into Banana Island Road is about 6 meters. And they don't have traffic issue. And it's far bigger than this. People are pulling down their houses because it is failing structurally. Why? Because they cannot do the proper foundation. Now you want to reduce density and height of units to five floors, four floors, and you wanted to spend that much money for foundation? Nobody's going to do that. The laws are there. And so people in Phoenix, they just break the laws. And before you come back, you say, oh my God, what is this? And you have no choice than to take penalties. And I sympathize with you on that. What that means is that, Mr. Commissioner, is that inspection ongoing must be very, very thorough. After hours of deliberations, the government comes up with a resolution it considers fair to all sides. Just maybe they have to sit down and iron their difference. It's not, we find out from this discussion, it's not about the, uh, the laws, the approval of the press. It's about individual interest and ego. We want to listen to you. What exactly are your worries? So that we can at least include them into our consideration. But you cannot ask us to forget the master plan that the Lagos State has put in place. At, it's on its back. We're making an investment today. An estate 
that was earlier planned to accommodate a certain number of population. And all of a sudden, you blossom that population without commensurate infrastructure, without you know, consideration to the environment. Before, we don't used to have the type of flooding we're having now. I know there is change in ozone layer, uh, depletions and all that, but that is not the case here. The case here is overbuilding. With the continued increase in demand for urban housing, especially in a city like Lagos, where there may be likely infractions and indiscriminate use of land, the state government reiterates its mandate of providing approval orders and also ensuring that specifications are strictly adhered to. Dari Ido, Channels Television News. The NLNG Ship Management Limited has embarked on an awareness and sensitization campaign aimed at sensitizing government officials and regulatory authorities on corporate efforts to curb the spread of COVID-19. The awareness campaign, which was flagged off at the NLNG subsidiary Stop Gap Fuel Limited in River State, is intended to provide clarity on the protocols and procedures to engender full compliance by all parties. It's the flag off of the Nigeria Liquefied Natural Gas Limited, NLLG Ship Management Limited campaign and sensitization and COVID-19 awareness. Present for the event are the NLLG subsidiary, Stop Gap Fuel Limited in Warfare River State, as well as port health officials, immigration, customs, and other ship clearing agencies in terminal operations. The exercise is aimed at providing clarity on the protocols and procedures to engender full compliance by all parties involved in clearing activities at the terminal to check the transmission of the virus while enhancing operational effectiveness. Our engagement today with the Stockdale Terminal is really about um, discussing the operational elements of COVID uh, prevention as well as recovery. So the, the engagement today was really to come together, sit down with our partners in the terminal, the government agencies that are responsible for clearing vessels, and look at the issues of COVID and ensure that we all get to the same page in terms of understanding what we need to do to continue to stay safe and continue to operate in a very efficient and safe manner. In addition to the sensitization exercise, steps are also being taken to achieve desired results. Where people are going to come on board, if they have to come on board, is to ensure that they go through the isolation protocol, the testing protocol, so that we are absolutely certain that before they go on board those vessels, that they are COVID-free. Now, all of these look together is really about ensuring that people, both on the vessel and at shore, we remain safe, keep themselves safe, and do not spread the virus, which can be very disruptive from an operational point of view. The company says the sensitization campaign, which also features medical insights on COVID-19 by the NLLG corporate medical team, will also be carried out in Lagos on the 7th and 8th of April. The Senate Committee on the Federal Capital Territory is querying the Executive Chairman of the FCT Internal Revenue Service, Abdullahi Atta, over its proposed remittance of 1 billion naira to the Federal Inland Revenue Service from its projected revenue collection. The committee made its observation when Mr. Atta appeared before members to defend his agency's 2021 budget approval. The chairman of the committee, Senator Abubakar Kiari, was dissatisfied with the explanation from the executive chairman that the proposed remittance is for the payment of salaries of 117 FIRS staff who are collaborating with the agency to generate revenue. Chairman, yes. we have agreed on that since last year, January 2020, in your last budget defense of 2020. We have agreed that that thing, nothing more will be paid to FIRS. They are not to collect anything on your behalf. We have given you all the, the support that you require, 100%.
and then you are still charging one billion again to go to FIRS. For what? And I, and, I, and I think that is why the Ministry of FCT is not even capturing or recognizing anything by FIRS. That collection that you are talking about, they are not making any efforts to go out and collect on your behalf. If they are making any effort to go out and collect on you, then you can go into an MOU due to lack of capacity. Are you trying to say you don't have the capacity to collect still up to now, three years into your administration? Because you are here now, uh, getting to four years actually. This is the fourth year since 2017. You made mention of NDIC and uh, what have you. I, I don't think it took them four years for them to... And like I said, we gave you all the support that you needed. All what you requested in 2020 we gave. 5.3 billion naira, and you only expended less than 800 million. The Nigerian Bar Association says it will investigate the circumstances surrounding the recent assault allegation leveled against the chairman of the Code of Conduct Tribunal, Danladi Umar. Mr. Umar was caught on video as he stepped out of his car at the plaza in the nation's capital, Abuja, and hit a security guard who had told him his vehicle was parked in the wrong space. The NBA said in a statement that as a member of the legal profession, Mr. Umar ought to maintain high professional conduct, noting that the NBA frowns on any display of force by a public officer, especially one who, by virtue of his high office, is expected to exhibit a high standard of conduct. The NBA says it will investigate the circumstances leading to the altercation through its relevant committee and, depending on its findings, will ensure that appropriate actions are taken to address the issue. Let's take a look at some business news now. Here's Taniola Shobowali. Thanks a lot, Ijeoma. Welcome to Business News. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies have agreed to gradually increase crude output over the next three months. At the 15th meeting held today via video conference, OPEC and non-OPEC ministers agreed to raise crude output by 350,000 in May, another 350,000 in June, and roughly 440,000 barrels per day in July. The ministers noted that since the April 2020 meeting, OPEC and non-OPEC participating countries in the Declaration of Cooperation had contributed to adjusting downward global oil supply by 2.6 billion barrels of oil by the end of February 2021, which has accelerated the rebalancing of the oil market. Meanwhile, oil prices have jumped higher following the announcement by OPEC and its allies of a gradual increase in crude production starting next month. Brent's crude for June delivery climbed by 2.93% to $64.68 a barrel, while U.S. WTI surged by 3.33% to $61.26 a barrel as at 9.55 p.m. local time. The OPEC Plus alliance is currently cutting crude oil production by just over 7 million barrels per day in an attempt to prop up prices and reduce oversupply. The volume of loans released by the Development Bank of Nigeria rose by 89% from 101.5 billion naira in 2019 to 191.7 billion naira in 2020, with majority dispersed to MSMEs in the country. According to its 2020 financial report, the bank says it recorded a 4% growth in its total asset, while its standing loans increased by 110% uh, owing to to the bank's increased lending to small businesses. Income from loans also grew by 60% to 105 billion naira last year, with returns on assets and equity at 4 and 11% respectively, while its earnings stood at 34.6 billion naira. 
Well, let's check in on the stock market now. It's another negative start in a new month uh, uh, for the domestic stock market after sell pressure takes a heavy toll on banking equities on the NSC. Ovi Bukomo has details of today's trading at the exchange. It is the last trading day for the week and the first for the new month. But the local equities market remains in the red for a third day. <laughs> now an additional 60 billion naira is lost to profit taking on the NSE as investors defy the release of more corporate results, which flooded the market on Wednesday. The impact of sell pressure led to a further but mild 0.33% drop on the all-share index and is largely attributed to a drop in the share price for, of some key bank equities. The loss also led to a 3.68% fall on their sector's index performance while some consumer goods components added to the downturn. So far, the month of March has towed the path for February, but by lower margin loss in the market's overall value. But let's keep our fingers crossed for the equities performance in April. The stock market will be closed on Friday and Monday for Easter break. That is it on the stock market report. I'm Uvie Bicomo. <laughs> And that's business news tonight. It's back to you, Ijeoma. Thanks a lot, Teniola. Witness testimony continued in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin in the death of George Floyd, whose death led to widespread protests against police brutality and racism. Derek Smith, a paramedic who was called to provide medical assistance to Floyd on May the 25th, 2020, testified that he believed Floyd was dead when he checked his pulse upon arriving at the scene as Chauvin and two other police officers were still pinning him to the ground. We'd like to warn our viewers that some of the details and videos shown in this case can be disturbing, so viewer discretion is advised. Here's Simon Pusey with more. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. In the US, a Minneapolis court has been shown new police body cam footage of George Floyd pleading with officers during his arrest. Okay, let me count to three. Let me count to three and I'm going in. Please. The video shows police officer Derek Chauvin with his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes and Mr. Floyd begging not to be harmed. Mr. Chauvin, who has since been fired from the police force, denies charges of murder and manslaughter. Defence lawyers have indicated they will argue that the 46-year-old died of an overdose and poor health and the force used was reasonable. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden has called for trillions of dollars in spending aimed at reigniting America's economic growth by upgrading its crumbling infrastructure and tackling climate change. Without somebody signing this bill today, there are hundreds The $2.3 trillion proposal would direct billions to initiatives such as charging stations for electric vehicles and eliminating lead water pipes. The spending would be partially offset by raising taxes on businesses. The plans, though, have already roused fierce opposition. Republicans have called the rises a recipe for stagnation and decline, while powerful business lobby groups said they supported investments but would oppose tax increases. Protests continue in Myanmar two months after the military junta took power, ousting the democratically elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Activists have burned copies of a military-framed constitution, while a UN special envoy warned of the risk of a bloodbath because of an intensified crackdown on anti-coup protesters. Over 500 people have lost their lives so far in the crackdown of the protests. Meanwhile, two military-owned shopping malls in Yangon, the main city of the country, were set alight during the night amid the ongoing protests. Seven of Hong Kong's most prominent pro-democracy campaigners have been convicted of unlawful assembly relating to huge demonstrations two years ago. Media tycoon Jimmy Lai and veteran politician Martin Lee were among those found guilty of organizing an unauthorized march. All seven had pleaded not guilty but now face time in prison. Two other activists had earlier already pleaded guilty and face up to five years in jail. The World Health Organization has criticized the rollout of coronavirus vaccines in Europe as being unacceptably slow. The WHO also said the situation in the region is more worrying than it had been for several months. Vaccination campaigns in much of Europe have been hit by delays and the number of infections is rising. France is the latest country to announce new lockdown measures lasting four weeks. 
Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has gone on hunger strike in an attempt to force the prison holding him outside Moscow to provide him with proper medical care. Mr Navalny accuses the prison administration of not providing medical care for his acute pain in his back and legs. Navalny's team posted on social media his handwritten letter addressed to the governor of his prison. It said his daily requests to be seen by a doctor of his choice and to receive proper medicine had been ignored. Mr Navalny was jailed last month for two and a half years for violating parole, a charge he calls politically motivated. Madagascar has changed tack and decided to join the global COVID-19 vaccine initiative COVAX. The Minister of Public Health defined the registration to the initiative as an important step in the process, as Madagascar had initially indicated that it would not participate in the initiative. The government said it would rather use a local traditional remedy known as COVID organics, despite the World Health Organization repeatedly highlighting how there's no known cure for COVID-19 as of now. Pope Francis has begun three hectic days leading to Easter with a Holy Thursday Mass where he told priests to be humble and not self-righteous. The Pope said the traditional Mass of the Chisholm is a secondary part of St. Peter's Basilica for about 200 people instead of the nearly 10,000 that have filled the church for similar ceremonies in pre-COVID times. During the homily, the Pope recalled how the preaching of Jesus created great public scandal at the time in matters that today would barely make the third page of a local newspaper. And finally, 16 years after losing his right arm in a car crash, a trainee priest has had his prayers answered thanks to a bionic arm. Following the crash and during a seven-month intense rehabilitation period, Mr Kant's six-year-old son, Aaron, discovered online the bionic hero arm from the British company Open Bionics. The prosthetic uses myoelectric sensors which detect underlying muscular contractions generated from specific muscle groups in the arm. Within hours of his first fitting, Mr Kant transitioned from living with no right arm for over a decade to being able to throw a ball and write his own name. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon. Sokoto, Kano and Kaduna states have confirmed their participation for the 20th edition of the National Sports Festival holding in Benin City, Edo State. The Gigenia Memorial Stadium in Sokoto accommodates different training sections for the state athletes. Camping exercise for the National Sports Festival has been completed and the state is confident of winning medals in the 12 sports it's featuring in. Kaduna State is going to the competition with 256 athletes in 25 sports. The government says it's excited about participating in the games as it hopes to win the right to host the next edition of the festival. We as a government and our people are all happy you know, to go to Benin and uh, hopefully uh, we will the host right and then again we will aggregate Nigeria and you know, sports loving fans across the continent and the world over in Kaduna uh, in 2022 so that we can showcase uh, you know, the enormous investment that we have made in the area of sporting infrastructure. Kano State Government announces it's taken a large contingent of 204 athletes to the competition because it has provided funds for the athletes to step up their position on the overall medal table. The number is so large because we are also carrying the burden of representing Northwest Zone in five team events because we emerged as champions in basketball, male and female, handball, volleyball and rugby. Athletes in the Northwest region are confident the Games will draw the attention of the various governments to sports development in their states. Well, the captain's armband that Cristiano Ronaldo threw onto the pitch is anger is up for auction to raise money for a sick child in Serbia. Now, the Portuguese star was denied a late winner in the World Cup qualifier in Belgrade on Saturday and could not hide his frustration. While well, the child, who is just six months old, suffers from spinal muscular dystrophy. And that sports news is back to you, John.
Thanks a lot, Ayal Tunde. And the main news again. Some Nigerian returnees from Saudi Arabia today alleged high-handedness by consulate officials. They also share their stories of abuse and molestation by their Arabian bosses. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thanks a lot for staying with us. I'm Ijeoma Konyato. Good night.